welcome once again. This is the Essentials of Political Analysis. I'm Philip Pollack. With the ideas of random error and uh, systematic error in mind, we can, we can use that theme to understand all these concepts in measurement. Uh, reliability and validity, these are two criteria. A reliable measure is a consistent measure of a concept. It gives you the same reading every time you, you, you that you, you measure the, the concept, you're getting same reading. It does, it does not have any random measurement error in it. It's consistent. It's free of random measurement error, gives you the same reading every time. So imagine a, an archer shooting at a target, and the archer hits very, very close to the same spot on the target every time. Now, it might not be the bullseye, but it, it would be a consistent hit at the same place in the target. So the consistency is the, uh, uh, that's the hallmark of a reliable measurement. A valid measurement, this is a harder, a tougher criterion, records the true value of the concept it's measuring. It's free of systematic measurement error. It gives you an accurate reading of the concept. Now, scholars argue whether you can have a measure that's valid but not reliable, and th there's some uh, argument about that. Uh, you can have a valid measurement uh, that lacks some reliability. Again, think of the archer shooting at the target, and the arrows are clustered around the bullseye. Maybe there's maybe around the, the the center ring. There's a few inside the ring. But when you look at it, you say, okay, there's there's some inconsistency here. There's some random error. But by and large, if we if we added all these up and divided them, so to speak, you'd come up with a very accurate measure of the bullseye. So uh, I think it's possible to talk about a valid measure that is not perfectly reliable. Now, obviously, if, if you have tons of random measurement error, uh, you're really uh, uh, going to have a hard, hard time measuring the concept. All right. How do we evaluate these two, these two criteria? Uh, reliability, of course, is an easier one to handle than than uh, than because random error is easier. We understand random error uh, pretty well. In fact, a chapter in the book talks about this. Um, and you can think you would think up ways yourself of, of evaluating how reliable a measure is. If it's some sort of if you have human subjects that you're studying, uh, test retest. If there, if you have a reliable measure, reliable tests. Uh, it should give you very close to the same reading each time. Compare two measurements taken at two points in time. If the measure is reliable, the two readings should be the same or very similar. If you don't have uh, overtime measures, uh, you can use this. You can use, say, uh, uh, test items within the same measure and ask, well, are those who are doing really well on this test getting every answer right, or there's some who are doing poorly on the test that tend to get some of the answers correct? Uh, so you can you can evaluate the reliability of a measure at one point in time as well. That's called the split half method. Uh, how a, a subject does on one half of the uh, uh, measurement should be very close to how they do on the other half of the measurement. Compare measurements made on two halves of the operational measure. The logical extension of this is, is a measure called Cronbach's alpha, which looks at uh, the relationship between individual items. So we have a pretty good, we have quite a protocol for evaluating reliability of a measure. Uh, validity is tougher. Now there are two general approaches that uh, you'll find texts that talk about more than two, but basically there are two ways to look at evaluating validity. The face validity approach and the construct validity approach. Let's look first at face validity. Ask yourself, this is the rhetorical. When you look at a measurement, are there good reasons to think that this, that this measure is not an accurate gauge of the intended characteristic. And again, here's an example from a public opinion research. This is American National Election Study. Uh, in the early years, they used this uh, measure of political efficacy. Well, here's the conceptual definition. Political efficacy is a feeling that people have, is the extent to which individuals believe that they can have an effect on government. So an efficacious person thinks that uh, uh, what, what they do as a political actor, if you will, will have an effect or can have an effect on what the government does. In, inefficacious people do not feel that way. Now, here was the measure. Here was, this is perfectly good a conceptual definition. Here was a measure that appeared on the American National Election Study. A question, agree or disagree? Voting is the only way that people like me can have any say about how the government runs things. 
Voting is the only way. Now, in its design, the designers of this question thought that, of course, if you have a high degree of efficacy, you're going to disagree with that because you might see, you, you certainly would see ways beyond voting. You contact elected officials, you could send an email to them, you know, you could uh, uh, engage in campaigning activity to try to get things done. And then an inefficacious person would tend to agree. But think about this. On its face, this measure, this operational measure, lacks validity. Are there good reasons to think that this instrument would not produce an accurate measurement of the intended characteristic political efficacy? Think of an individual whose sense of efficacy is so weak that they view any active political participation, including voting, as an exercise in political futility. So they would tend to be measured, they, they would say uh, disagree to this question, but they would say disagree because they don't think voting even works. Quite reasonably, they could disagree. A response that would be me measure them as having a large amount of the intended characteristic and not the absence of the intended characteristic. Taken at face value in the survey question, it's not a valid measure. Uh, you know, it, it bears emphasizing again that once you realize that you have systematic measurement error like this and you have an invalid measure, you, you don't know how, how many people were affected in, in, the, in these ways, how many ineff inefficacious people disagreed, how many efficacious people disagreed. If you knew that, you could adjust the measure, you could take out the bias, but we don't know. So we have to get rid of it. All these problems in here in the measure of efficacy, get rid of that question. It's just not a valid measure. Now here's, uh, this is a more sophisticated way of evaluating a validity. And this looks at the relationship between your measure of the concept and other concepts to which it should be related. Does this measurement have relationships with other concepts that one would expect it to have? And the example in the book is the measure of party identification, which uh, has, it's a venerable concept in, uh, in political uh, behavior, American political behavior specifically. And uh, you would expect that this measure would have a predictable relationship with other concepts. Party identification is the extent to which individuals, individual people, I should say there, feel a sense of attachment to one of the, of the two major political parties. It's measured by a seven point scale. It seems like there are a lot of seven point scales in the public opinion research from strong Democrat to not strong Democrat, called weak Democrats, independent leaning Democrats, pure independents, independent leaning Republicans, and weak, weak Republicans and strong Republicans. If you look at the operational measure, it's hard to fault it on face validity grounds. The interviewer asks, generally speaking, do you think of yourself as a Republican, a Democrat, and an independent, or what? Respondents are given six choices, Democrat, Republican, independent, other party, no preference, and don't know. Those who choose Democrat or Republican are, are asked, quote, would you call yourself a strong Democrat, Republican, or not very strong Democrat or, or Republican? Those who choose independent, other party, and no preference or don't know are asked, do you think of yourself as closer to the Republican Party or the Democratic Party? See, this is how uh, research, survey researchers tease out the seven pointers. So they, they take those who pick Democrat or Republican first and find out how strongly they attach, then those who pick independent and other responses to see if they're leaning toward one of the parties. It's difficult to fault this measure from the standpoint of face, face validity. <clears throat> but consider how party identification relates to explicitly partisan activities, such as campaigning activity. You would expect the more strongly partisan a person is, uh, the more likely they would be to engage in campaigning activity, you know, uh, attending rallies, uh, uh, displaying uh, bumper stickers or, or yard signs, uh, contributing money to campaigns. Uh, these, these aren't measures of partisanship, but they're measures of an activity that should be very strongly related to partisanship. The party ID scale behaves as it should for strong partisans and independents. Let's look at this relationship between party identification and campaigning and look to see if there's anything amiss. 
Uh, this is figure 1-1 in the text. <clears throat> you can see here, here are strong Democrats on the left, all the way to strong Republicans on the right. This is the average number of campaign acts that uh, the partisans engaged in in the 2012 uh, campaigns. And notice, strong Democrats are up here more than one act <clears throat> on average. Republicans are also up there, strong Republicans are up there, and you'd expect the strong partisans to be the most active in campaigning. The pure independents, they're centered down here um, at the lowest, so do you, you're getting the nice V-shape if you look at those uh, partisan types. But here, among the independent leaners and weak partisans, there's almost no difference. The reason you can tell there's no difference is the error bars. This is what's called an error bar plot or error bar chart that uh, if you take into account random measurement error, uh, the brackets show you the, the bandwidth, if you will, of these mean estimates. And if two uh, bars overlap, they're statistically indistinguishable from each other. And you can see here, almost complete overlap with the independent and weak Democrats and the same thing on the Republican side. You know, it's this kind of thing that um, raises questions about the validity of the measure of party ID. And of course, scholars have I looked into this and tried to understand what party identification, what unintended characteristic party identification might be picking up.